Praise the Lord, Palm Sunday. Amen. Amen. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Wait, oh. There you go. <laughs> we celebrate Jesus today. Amen. And as I was preparing this message, I just shared with the Thursday morning men's Bible study that it's sometimes it's most difficult to preach um, Palm Sunday and Easter because the message essentially is the same. But how many of you like a nice fresh salad? Amen. I, I personally don't like new things in my salad. And I especially don't like things that move in my salad. <laughs> but I like the things that are fresh and ready for today. So I pray that this message is, is that for you as well. The message is called, He Will Enter Again. And I want us to turn to Luke chapter 19, and we'll be in verse 28 through 40. Father God, help me to proclaim the word today. This is a powerful, powerful story and time that we're looking into. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to preach the word with power and authority and clarity. Help your people to hear what the Spirit is saying to them today. Lord, I pray that you give them eyes of revelation and ears to hear what the Spirit says. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When I look at the story of triumphal entry of Christ, it's mentioned in all four Gospels. Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke chapter 19, and John chapter 19 as well. And when I look at the study of the of, of this wonderful story of the triumphal entry, there are three things I want us to keep in mind. Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey and being celebrated, and he did that on the tenth of Nisan which, according to Exodus chapter twelve, was the day that each family selected a lamb and brought it into their house to be the Passover lamb. You know, that move was to make it very personal. Can you imagine selecting your most precious one-year-old lamb and then having to bring it in the house, feeding it, feeding it, taking care of it? Well, there's a lot of connection there, right? Um, and the way the scripture is set up, sacrifices like the Passover could not be impersonal. So you couldn't say, well, you do it, let me know how it goes. Uh, but every family was involved with the Paschal Lamb in their home for four days. So Jesus entered Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. On the 14th of Nisan, he died for us as the Lamb of God. And John says in John chapter 1, John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's what we're commemorating here as well. The second thing we're commemorating is the worship of a king. Pilate says, are you a king? He says, yes, I am. It's just like you said it. And Jesus confessed him, not only telling him straightforward, but he told Pilate, yes, I'm a kingdom. I'm a king from a kingdom you don't even know anything about. Thirdly, 
were reminded by this triumphal entry that he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that he will come back again in a very different way a second time. So that's going to be kind of our focus today on the three aspects of the triumphal entry. Let's look at verse 28. After telling this story, Jesus went <coughs> out towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of the disciples. As he came to the town of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. The Mount of Olives was on the eastern side of Jerusalem. It was adjacent to the temple itself. The temple was right <coughs> close by on the northeastern side. And when you look at Jerusalem and, and the New Testament, you see the little bit of background here. Jerusalem is built upon a hill called Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah is a mountain range. Uh, by comparison to Big Bear, not so much. But in the top um, northwest corner, you have Mount Calvary, where Jesus died, and his son. And then on the east, northeast corner, you have um, the Mount of Olives, the Holy Spirit. And then to the southeast corner, you have Mount Zion, signifying the Father. So Jerusalem is a, uh, is a picture of Mount Moriah with the Mount Calvary, the Son, Mount of Olives, the, the Holy Spirit and Mount Zion, the Father. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I mean, everything testifies to who God is <coughs> if we look for it. Verse 31, if anyone asks, why are you untying the colt? Just say to them, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt just as Jesus had said <coughs> And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. I, Jesus, the prophet, is showing up here with a strong word of knowledge that this is how it's going to be. Go to the certain place, you'll find somebody tells tell you they're going to find a donkey, and the second thing, they're going to ask you a question, answer this way. So we see the powerful word of knowledge from Jesus here in this passage. When he reached the place on the road started down the Mount of Olives. All of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. You want a reason to praise Jesus? Look no further than all the miracles that he's done in your life. Amen. All the things that he's done, all the intangibles, the things that he's done in your life that you're not even aware of, all the timing, all the <coughs> thing, interactions with, with people being. Jesus has been with you throughout all the intangibles, and he's with you through all the tangibles, the things that you can visibly see. 
you know, when we look at our family, Trish and I, we couldn't have shopped and got two boys and brought them home. It's not the way it works. God had to orchestrate all of that and make things happen. So in your life, right? Mm -hmm. The miracles we can testify of, of the intangibles and the tangibles, the reality of Jesus in our life. Verse 38, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. One of the first times we heard that is when the angelic hosts were praising God with those very words concerning the birth of Jesus. But some of the Pharisees you know, they always invited themselves to the party, didn't they? Party crashers. It's like we invited everybody, but why did you show up, you know? <laughs> Pharisees. The Pharisees were the only sect of Judaism that Jesus associated with. Because they had hard regard, high regard for the Torah, the Nadim, the Ketuvim, the three scrolls. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in eternal life. Jesus had a lot in common with them. But the thing that Jesus did never liked about them is that their religion was more important than than faith in the Word of God. The, what they did and the traditions became more important. So as they said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. Pharisees did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. There was a few, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and others who did. But if you don't believe who Jesus is, you're not going to see him for who he is, and you're going to respond the best way you can, right? First of all, worship. If you re worship someone, you're declaring that they are God. Secondly, if that person accepts worship, they are declaring they are God as well. So the Pharisees' response without knowing Jesus was a just and right one. Hey, what are you doing praising this man? You know. But the fact is that Jesus is God deserving of worship, and we are his people. We come to worship him because we know who he is. Amen. He replied, <coughs> if they keep quiet, quiet, if you keep quiet, the stones along the road will burst into cheers. The stones will cry out. <coughs> Uh, you know, we have songs about this. Don't let the stone rocks cry out. Don't let the rock take your place. Amen? Amen. Don't let a rock take your place. Amen. Amen. Don't be quiet about the, the worship of the Lord. In this passage, there's nothing quiet. There are no stoic Norwegians in this story. No story, stoic uh, Scandinavians. You know, what I mean by that is like, what are you doing? I'm worshiping God with my whole heart. Well, <laughs> like Trish would tell me, tell your face that. <laughs> act like, act like you're praising and worshiping God. Amen. It's 
Some people are funny. <laughs> Clap your hands, raise your hands, shout and sing to the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, hallelujah. Get down for Jesus. Celebrate him. <clears throat> now the time for <coughs> bowing your head and remain in the silence. Now for time. Don't let any rock cry out in your in your behalf. Nope. Amen. In the story also you have a king riding on a donkey, and that was never heard of. Why? Because donkeys are symbolic of humility, lowliness, and peace. And you never, you never would see a warrior on a donkey. But the second coming is going to be different. He's going to ride in Jerusalem, come again. This time, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords riding on a horse, which all conquerors and kings rode horses. First time he came to humbly lay down his life to save us. Second time he's coming to judge those that are opposing him and he will destroy all his enemies right now he's trying to win all of his enemies the 7.9 billion people on the planet can you believe that i think when i was real little it was about two billion um, and then in 1967 around there it was three billion now it's every 12 years down a billion. That'll go down to every 10 years pretty soon. But God wants everyone to be saved. Wants everyone to be saved. But there come a time when he comes again. And in that coming will be a time of setting up his kingdom. Ezekiel chapters 48, 40 through 48 describe the millennium and eternity and also says that the eastern gate is permanently closed and that the prince, who is Jesus, will one day enter through that closed gate that's been closed for 2,000 years because there's a time for the Lord to rule and reign. You can look that up in <coughs> chapters 40 through 48 of Ezekiel. I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 19. On my heart in, in preaching for the last few weeks has been to wake us up and to alert us that the Lord is coming soon. The rapture of the church is right around the corner. We will meet him in the air and so be with the Lord always. He's coming to get together to gather all of us. We have to prepare in the same way because he might come for you personally. You just never know. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven open. It's going to be a, the, one, the greatest opening in heaven will be what we're reading about now. The Bible talks about open heaven. It's talking about a connection between heaven and earth. So the heavens are going to open. And a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. 
His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Cross-reference that with Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 1, where they give a similar the description of Jesus Christ being actually God in this moment. A name was written on him that no one understood except him, he himself. So a, a name is written on Jesus that none of us will know. You okay with that? Amen. He wore a robe dipped in blood. And his title was the Word of God. <coughs> Jesus is the Logos of eternity. Jesus is the Rhema of eternity. When it talks about Jesus being the Word of God, he is the divine expression of God himself. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. And also Colossians chapter 1. He is the exact representation of the Father. And we have the Bible as the Word of God, meaning that the Bible is not Jesus, but the Bible gives us the Word of God and a relationship with God through His Word. A robe dipped in blood. The sacrifice is done. It's finished. He had paid the price. All of humanity uh, will bow before him one way or the other. In Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11, whether they're in the heart of the earth, in hell, or in heaven, or on the earth, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Here's, here's your part. Here's where you come in. The armies of heaven. You're in, you're in the army of heaven. Isn't that good? Amen. Amen. If you're not, you need to find Jesus as your Savior. Because this side of the fence is the only side you want to be on on that day. So you will be dressed in the finest white linen, following him on white horses. Anna, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? We all have our own personal white horse. We have white robes. We're following him. Where in the battle? Where in the victory? Where in a situation where? He's going to clean house on the face of the earth. Daniel chapter 12 says after he comes, it will take 45 days to renovate the earth, get it ready for the millennial reign. That would be fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to get a new dress, a new horse the verse 15 from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations you can look up Psalm 145 through 150 for that he will rule them with a rod iron rod you know when we're with Jesus Ruling with a Ryan odd rod is no big deal because we'll never experience that rod, right? Mm -hmm. But during the millennium, there are going to be mortals that will be reproduced in the millennium and they'll be tried. And Jesus will not have any rebellion in the millennium. <coughs> At the end of the millennial reign will be the second battle of Gog and Magog 
where by the same expression, by the breath of his mouth, all his enemies will be destroyed. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe and on his thigh were written his title, King of Kings and Lord of all Lords. That's got to start with you in your heart. King of kings and Lord of lords. Make sure there's no one else, nothing else sitting on the throne of your heart but the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Then I saw an angel standing, look at this, standing in the sun, S-U-N, shouting to the vultures, living, flying high in the sky, come gather together for the great banquet God has prepared for you. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, and of all humanity, both free, slaves, small, and great. That's the battle of Armageddon. Jesus come back. Second time, not to be confused with the rapture that happened seven years before. The rapture of the church happened seven years before. We are coming back with him in white robes on white horses. And then there's going to be a battle, a battle of Armageddon where Jesus is going to clear out all of his enemies. Verse 19, then I saw the beasts and the kings of the world and their armies gathered, gathered together to fight against the one sitting on his horse and his army. There'll be no pity. There'll be no mercy. There'll not be any relenting. There'll not be none of the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus is coming on a mission at the Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon, <clears throat> to destroy his enemies so that he can set up his kingdom. And the beast was captured. The Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And with him the false prophet, the head religious figure, who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and worshipped his statue, that is the image of the beast, three aspects. Antichrist, false prophet, and the image of the beast. Both the beast and the false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. You, you glad about that? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse. It seems to indicate that you, dressed in white robes and seated on your white horse, accompanying him, We'll not have to fight. We won't have to do but anything but accompany Jesus. Because Jesus, he will do battle. And he has a way of doing it through the words of his mouth. And it's all done. I imagine we're saying, well, mm -hmm. I'm so glad I'm on this side of the fence. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ is my King of Kings, Lord of Lords. I will rule and reign with him. That's part of what we're seeing today in the triumphal entry is that first time on a donkey with peace and sacrifice, second time on a horse with power and demonstration. 
Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came out of his mouth as one riding the horse, and the vultures gorged themselves on dead bodies. Zechariah chapter 4, 14, verse 4 through 9 gives us Zechariah's picture of the second coming of Christ and entering Jerusalem once again. You remember in our story in Luke chapter 9, they came from the Mount of Olives and threw them there to the temple, right? It's very significant when we look at Zechariah's passage. <clears throat> on that day, his feet, the feet of Jesus, will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will split apart, making a wide valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will be toward the north, and the other towards the south. You can see a, a majestic highway being created because Jesus' feet, the second coming, lands on Mount Olives. A big earthquake, actually almost a God-made freeway at that point. I mean, everything, and everything leveled for the forest entrance. You will flee through this valley for a reach across from the Azel. Yes, you will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come with all his holy ones with him. Doesn't that sound like Revelation 19? Mm -hmm. It does because it is. He will come back with all his holy ones with him. That's a combination of us made holy by the blood of Jesus and also the angelic forces coming with us as well. On that day, the source of light will no longer shine, yet there will be continuous day. Only the Lord knows that how this could happen. There will be no normal day and night, and for an evening time there will still be light. On that day, life-giving waters will flow out from Jerusalem towards the Dead Sea and out towards the Mediterranean Sea, flowing continuously in both summer and winter. Ezekiel again, 46 through 48, around there. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. We worship today, said Hosanna to the Son of God. That name will be worshipped. He's coming again. Amen. Amen. And in my spirit, I, uh, I just have a passion that says that God has a message for us all to communicate, that we pray that people get saved in the last days, that we pray that God would keep us uh, as sharp and ready for the rapture of the church, and that we be lights where we need to be lights, that we be salt where we need to be salt, and God will use us in the last days. Amen. 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 Father God, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Hosanna in the Hosanna. highest. Hosanna. We celebrate you, Lord Jesus. You came on the tenth of Nisan as the Lamb of God, Exodus 12. You came riding on a donkey, uh, a king rather laying down his life. But you also are coming back again on a white horse with your, with all of us to set up your kingdom. 
Thank you for your goodness and grace. Bless each one here. Keep them safe this holy week. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat>